Okay, this is a lecture for my uh, second hour U.S. history class on uh, April the 5th. And we left off the other day, we were uh, in the election of uh, 1960, and uh, we were just talking about the assets and the liabilities that uh, both candidates uh, had. Um, we will not take a test tomorrow, although I, you're probably going to, I, I don't know if I'm actually going to see you tomorrow, which will be Thursday, but anyway, um, probably it will be after Easter break, probably, uh, but even if we have class tomorrow, meet tomorrow, we'll just have a lecture, and then your test will be sometime in the week after, uh, after uh, Easter break, okay? So anyway, what I want to do this morning is I want to go ahead and finish this election. Um, and we talked yesterday how about how, how you know, even though Nixon had advised his staff, don't criticize, don't bring up religion. Um, even though a lot of Americans uh, would not vote for a Roman Catholic simply because he was a Roman Catholic, uh, Nixon said stay clear of that issue. In other words, it'll blow up in our faces. And that's exactly what happened. Nixon didn't bring it up. His, his campaign didn't bring it up. Uh, I, I, Nixon was not a religious bigot. In other words, he was not prejudiced against people because uh, of their religion. He was much more interested in how they stood on the great issues of the day, their politics, not their religion. And that's what a political campaign ought to be about, someone's politics, not their religion. And uh, that was Nixon's attitude. But uh, there was a Protestant minister, I don't know who the famous ministers are today, uh, when I was a boy, it was Billy Graham, uh, you know, and for many, many years after I was a boy, uh, it was Billy Graham. There's a pastor named Rick Warren and others you probably know of and listen to and maybe your followers of. Uh, but, uh, you know, today they're great television preachers, and Norman Vincent Peale was that. Uh, he was a book author, uh, and uh, I can't think of the famous book he, he wrote uh, right now. Uh, he wrote several, but anyway, he was... You know, a leading Protestant minister in America, and, and he brought that up. He, had, he called the press conference and said, I just don't think that John F. Kennedy can separate himself from his church when it comes to making decisions that will affect the whole country, and even the whole world. And Kennedy, his staff said, just go on, ignore it, just act like it didn't happen. If we get in a religious argument, it can only hurt us. Uh, but Kennedy didn't. He met the issue head on, and he went down was invited by a group of Protestant ministers. And I think I showed you that little film clip yesterday in Houston, Texas. Um, and uh, they uh, invited Kennedy down to speak to them, uh, the Houston Ministerial, Ministerial Alliance, all these different Protestant groups met. And uh, Kennedy went in and acquitted himself quite well. You know, he said, that I am ever confronted with an issue while I'm president of the United States and uh, I could not separate uh, myself from my religion in making that issue, in making that decision. He said, "I will, I will resign." Uh, Kennedy also was a wounded veteran from World War II. Nobody asked him if he was a Roman Catholic when he joined. And of course, he sat on the campaign trail several times. Nobody asked his brother Joe, who had died fighting for this country, uh, what his religious religion was before he went into the service. And so, again. You know, this could have been maybe fatal to the Kennedy campaign, but it renounced, this whole religious issue renounced in the favor of John F. Kennedy because, like I say, uh, he met it He met it head on. Uh, he said, uh, uh, so, uh, you know, he said, he said very clearly in that, you heard him say it yesterday, uh, that uh, uh, he did not believe that any Catholic prelate, uh, a priest, a bishop, a cardinal, a pope, and he didn't believe they had any business trying to instruct the President of the United States how the President of the United States should act or decide on the political issues. That, that has no place in government. And he also said, and I do not believe that any Protestant minister, any Protestant preacher, pastor, whatever you want to call him, uh, should uh, stand up and tell his congregation who to vote for in this election. Uh, he also said that he, uh, and this is an issue in Oklahoma right now, in case you haven't noticed, and I probably mentioned yesterday, he said that he didn't think that any taxpayer money should go to support any public, uh, excuse me, any religious school. Any, he said the taxpayer's money uh, should support public schools, not a religious school. 
if you want your child to go to Cassia Hall, which is a religious school, or uh, Mount St. Mary's, um, and I can't think of any others right now in Oklahoma, but there are others. If you want your child to attend a religious school, then you have to pony up and you have to pay for the tuition to do that. The public money, that's public tax money, goes to support public institutions, not private uh, uh, schools, for that matter, just private schools or private religious schools. And so Kennedy, I think, acquitted himself quite well and did a lot. He didn't entirely put it away, but he did a lot uh, to tamp down this religious uh, issue, okay? But uh, I, I tell you this, uh, this state that you live in voted for Richard Nixon, a Republican, and Oklahoma, maybe they had voted for Eisenhower, I'm happy to check, but Oklahoma um, uh, voted for Richard Nixon. It had been a, uh, Oklahoma had been a solid Democrat state that voted for Richard Nixon because John F. Kennedy was a Roman Catholic. Okay, so that. Uh, but of course, like I said yesterday, uh, we've had several John Kerry uh, and others uh, nominated. They didn't win, but nominated for president. Wasn't even an issue in the John Kerry campaign. We've had Joe Biden elected president, and there were a lot of issues in between him and Donald Trump, but one of them wasn't religion. Countries grow up. Countries mature, just like people do, and hopefully we're past that. Although, like I say, we like to think we are, and we're very broad-minded and open-minded, and we believe in the law, and we believe in the Constitution, and we believe in the Bill of Rights, we believe in the First Amendment, we believe in freedom of religion, but probably many of you, maybe none of you, um, I may be wrong, maybe all of you would vote for a Muslim, uh, but I doubt it, okay? I doubt it. If a, if a Muslim were not, and someday one will be, if a Muslim uh, were nominated to be president of the United States, all the old charges used against Kennedy and Catholicism uh, would surface, I assure you, in that campaign against a Muslim. Well, anyway, most people agree that that religious issue is paramount in this election, to understanding uh, the uh, election of 1960. Uh, but anyway, most agree, however, that the uh, turning point of this uh, campaign was the televised debates, uh, first presidential debates in American history. And they had four televised debates. Now it's just sort of become a tradition. Uh, every four years, you know, the candidates debate. And if you watch them, if you watch them today, uh, they're more or less style shows. Uh, you won't learn very much from it, uh, both sides, instead of telling us really what they believe or think or would do as president, both candidates try and keep from offending a key constituency. Uh, and maybe by losing that constituency, they'll lose the race. So, so they're, so they're uh, you know, trying to not make mistakes, okay? Uh, this one, though, uh, was uh, quite a contrast between the two candidates. Uh, and although I say the last debates that anyone uh, really ever learned anything about candidates was the Lincoln-Douglas debates of 1858 when Lincoln challenged Stephen Douglas for the Senate of the United States and by the way he lost that race but four years later he was president in many ways that debate that he, he lost the race but in many ways that debate made him president of the United States but anyway Nixon and Kennedy, I think there was they were pretty. Uh, you know, there were a lot of sub substantial issues, uh, and I think uh, the the candidates were very uh, forthcoming. I think presidential debates have gone downhill since. But anyway, there were four of these. They were on television. This has never happened in the United States history before, and uh, you know, uh, millions and millions and millions of Americans are going to tune in. And I don't know if you can see this picture behind me, but it's uh, you know, there's the, there Kennedy and Nixon in the studio uh, debating. I have a little film clip from these debates that I will show you the next time I see you. Anyway, Nixon was a very experienced debater. Uh, he uh, had literally crammed his head full of facts and he thought that Kennedy was sort of just this playboy out there running around, uh, lightweight, and he thought he would demolish him. Uh, but Nixon had some problems going into this debate. Uh, you remember I said that he had gashed his knee on that car and it had become door and it had become infected and he had spent a couple of weeks in the hospital. Well, at the time of these debates, uh, he had not recovered from that. He was thin, he had lost weight, uh, his shirt collar was too big. Um, he, Nixon had a problem, he had a five o'clock shadow. He could shave twice a day and still have beard showing, the five o'clock shadow. 
and someone persuade. Nixon refused to wear makeup in these debates. Kennedy takes the makeup, but Nixon refused to wear, you know, they make up these people when they go on television. And Nixon refused that. But one of his campaign aides came up with this thing called lazy, lazy shave. And it was just this um, uh, plaster almost that you put on your face and you smeared it on your face and it would cover up, up your beard. And of course, uh, during the debates, uh, Nixon was going to be perspiring. That's another problem he had when he's, uh, Nixon perspired profusely uh, uh, when under pressure. And these guys are under a lot of pressure. And when the cameras would pan in on Nixon, let's see here. When the camera, there's, uh, you know, uh, anyway, you can see it better in the film. When the, when the cameras would pan, on, pan in on Nixon, you could literally see his perspiration making streaks in that lazy shape on his face. I'm sure he looked like a dead man. Kennedy, on the other hand, bounces in. Uh, he had been campaigning in California for several days. Uh, he, had got, he had gotten a great tan. He had been out in the open air. He was very refreshed. He walks in, relaxed, uh, and essentially came in and took charge, uh, came in and took charge of those uh, debates, okay? And there, there they are, and there's another one going, they're going at each other. Uh, well, Nixon, as I say, looked like a dead man. And Nick Kennedy comes in, you know, he, he knows the psychology of the moment. Nixon comes in, excuse me, Kennedy comes in, and he's going to treat Nixon like an inferior. And when he starts, you know, he talks down to Nixon, almost like you're not good enough. What are you doing on this stage? And, of course, Nixon, uh, his inferiority complex that he had all of his life is going to shine through. Uh, Linda Johnson, who was Nixon, uh, Kennedy's, excuse me, Kennedy's vice presidential running mate, listened to the debate. He didn't watch it on television. He listened by radio. And he called Kennedy up uh, after uh, the uh, debate, and he said, Nixon kicked the you-know-what out of you. On the radio, most people who listened by radio said Nixon won. But the people who watched television said Kennedy won it, walking away. Um, Kennedy looked good. Uh, he looked, char he was charming, uh, he was witty, uh, he was substantive, he had a good command of the uh, great issues of the day, and uh, this sort of dispelled any notions that Kennedy uh, was not ready to be president, and Nixon was this experienced uh, vice president who was now ready to step in and fill the shoes of one of the most popular presidents ever, if not the most popular, Dwight Eisenhower. N Nick Kennedy's looks his wit, his charm, uh, his relaxed manner. Uh, he didn't get ruffled at all when the press asked him questions or when Nixon asked, you know, Nixon made a charge against him. That all worked. Of course, Nixon, uh, the, the Nixon campaign watching this on television, they looked and they said, you, you know, you look like a dead man. You've got to gain some weight. And Nixon, uh, for the next, I think it was a week or two, between the two debates and the next debate, but Nixon drank five milkshakes a day trying to gain weight. And he did gain back some of his weight by the second debate, and he did look better, and he probably performed better. But the point is, um, America had made up its mind in that first televised debate, the first debate. You've heard that some people say first, that first impressions are everything. I think that, that may not always be true, but I think it was true in this campaign. And finally, on October the 19th, just weeks, you know, we voted on the first Tuesday of November, just weeks before the election, a couple of weeks, on uh, October 19th, Martin Luther King was arrested in Atlanta for staging a sit-in at an all-white lunch camp. And immediately, Nixon was out on the campaign trail. And Nixon was not a racist. Uh, he had fought against racism all of his life. And immediately, Nixon, in fact, Martin Luther King's father, who was a Protestant minister, Dr. Martin Luther King Sr., uh, and he was a Republican, uh, had endorsed Nixon. He had, had endorsed, almost in front of his congregation, he had endorsed Nixon. But when the press asked Nixon out on the campaign trail about Dr. Martin Luther King being arrested, what do you think about Mr. Nixon? Nixon said, he dodged the question, he said, no comment. Whereas John Kennedy didn't say much about it either, but he instructed his younger brother, Robert, and you're going to see that Robert 
is JFK's hatchet man. Uh, when uh, something needs to be done important, uh, Kennedy will call on Robert, and he asked Robert Kennedy to call a federal judge in Georgia on John F. Kennedy's behalf and ask him if Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., who had been arrested for staging this sit-in, could be uh, released. And uh, of course, you know, Robert Kennedy said, I'm calling on behalf of my brother, you know, he's running for president of the United States. And this federal judge thinks, you know, this guy may be president of the United States. I'm not saying that influences, influences his decision, but I am saying that the federal judge uh, released Dr. King, okay? He released him. And when that happened, uh, Martin Luther King, Martin Luther King Jr.'s father, Martin, I don't want to throw too many Martin Luther Kings in here, but Martin Luther King's father, uh, Martin Luther King Sr., who, like I say, was a Baptist, and he had said openly, I cannot vote for a Catholic, announced that he was switching from Nixon to Kennedy. Nixon to Kennedy. Just think about that. Martin Luther King's father prejudiced against Catholics, bigoted against Catholics. But he switched to Kennedy and a lot of African Americans. And by the way, there were many African Americans. I'm not sure about this, but a slight majority of African Americans may have been Republicans in 1960. Uh, and uh, that swung many of those confirmed Republican African Americans over to the Kennedy camp. And this is such a close election. There are 68 million votes cast, and it's decided by a mere handful, 112,000 votes. Um, African Americans may have elected John Kennedy, John Kennedy president. And of course, when uh, John Kennedy was told that Martin Luther King's father, who had said, I cannot vote for a Catholic, that's real prejudice as well, I cannot vote for a Catholic, was switching over to support Kennedy, uh, Kennedy shook his head, you know, people thought, well, you know, JFK might criticize Martin Luther King's father in private, but he didn't. He just sort of shook his head and said, well, we all have fathers, don't we? Yeah, Kennedy had, had his father as well. Um, anyway. Uh, there was vote stealing on both sides. It's, I believe, the closest election, closest election in history. Like I say, out of 68 million votes cast, Kennedy won. I'll put this well. Kennedy, I'll just say it. Kennedy won 34 million, 226,925 votes. 34 million votes. 34.2 million votes. And Richard Nixon won 34. Million one hundred eight thousand six hundred sixty-two votes. The winning margin for JFK was one hundred twelve thousand votes. And of course, you know that the popular vote doesn't decide the presidency. The electoral vote does. But those one hundred and twelve thousand votes gave JFK uh, a majority in the electoral college. If you want it in percentages, uh, Kennedy won forty-nine point. Listen, listen, forty-nine point. 7% of the vote, and Nixon won 49.6. Uh, here's some more percentage for you. JFK beat Nixon by 0.2% of the popular vote, 0.2%. And of course, at first, the Nixon campaign uh, considered challenging the vote up in Cook County, Illinois, and I think there's no doubt there was an old Irish boss up there named Daly, the mayor of Chicago, and um, I have no doubt that Mayor Daley stole votes uh, for the Kennedy side. Uh, and some of Nixon's staff said, hey, you know, we ought to, uh, we ought to uh, challenge that vote. But at the same time, they had to admit that Republicans also had stolen votes. You want an election with stolen votes? This is it, stolen votes. Uh, and Kennedy was announced as the winner. Uh, and, of course, Kennedy was worried. Uh, that Nixon might not accept this, that he might challenge this, and if it was challenged, um, it might be proven that Nixon had really won this election. Uh, but Nixon, Nixon, I think, you know, this is Nixon's finest hour. Usually if people want to talk about somebody evil in politics, they say Richard Nixon related to Watergate and other 
things that took place in the Nixon administration. But, uh, you know, Nixon wasn't all evil. Uh, Nixon was no dummy. I think he's the best foreign policy president we ever had. That's just my personal opinion and the personal opinion of a lot of people smarter than me. But I will tell you this. I think his finest hour was when he lost in 1960. You know, Nixon had clawed his way to the top. And he knew that he might have won that election. I will tell you, we will never know who really won the election of 1960. We do know who became president, John F. Kennedy. And Kennedy was worried that Nixon would challenge him. But Nixon conceded the election. You know, Nixon conceded to the election, as opposed to Donald Trump, who said before the election one vote was even cast, and if he lost the election, it would be rigged. Uh, and he never answered the question in a debate that if he lost the election, would he accept the outcome of the election? He never, never answered that question. And by the way, since 2020, here we are in 2023, he has never conceded the race. Well, Nixon stepped forward. And he can, I'll show you his concession speech tomorrow. And he announced that John F. Kennedy had won the election. How painful that must have been. That John F. Kennedy had won the election and that he wished him well and that he would give his support to the new president of the United States. That's the way we used to. We fought these campaigns were hard. They were dirty. There were some votes stealing. But that's the way we used to play politics in America. And then on top of that, he flew down to the Kennedy House in Florida. I never can think and remember what it is, what the name. But anyway, the Kennedys had a beach. It's kind of like Donald Trump has Mar-a-Lago down there uh, in Palm Beach. The Kennedys had, yeah, I think it's Palm Beach. The Kennedys had a uh, house down there where they would vacation. And he flew down there and uh, he met with Kennedy, okay? Uh, this is after this hard fought election. Uh, there they are, right there in Florida. He went down and he shook hands with Kennedy, and he, wished him, and he wished him well. He wished him well. And you know what? Uh, Nick had his photograph made. Uh, you know, this was at the most dangerous moment of the Cold War. Uh, I think this is Nixon's finest hour. Uh, I think he put his personal ambition behind him for a moment and said, at this dangerous moment in the history of our nation and the history of the world, uh, we cannot go without a leader. We can't have this investigation as to who really won this election or who won this election or who stole votes or who didn't steal votes. We can't have this going on at this dangerous hour in the life of our country. And so he conceded. He conceded. He put his personal ambitions behind him for a moment. They never went away, of course. His personal ambitions behind him for a moment. And he went down. And by shaking hands with the president, he said to his supporters, and the whole world. This man is the president of the United States, and I'm going to support him. Uh, and I think that that might have been Nixon's finest hour. Okay. Well, the Kennedy administration started in January, January 20th, 1961. And when <coughs> we return, when I see you again, we will take up the Kennedy administration, January 20th, 1961. Um, if you have a makeup test, you need to make it up today. I don't know when you'll watch this, but uh, if you have a makeup test, today is the deadline on that. Uh, our test will be the week after Easter break, and I can't think of anything else to tell you, so I will stop there.